This show is brought to you by Mansions and Manors. They are the leading real estate firm in Jamestown, Rhode Island. There's no one quite like Mansions and Manors. They are very supportive, they are like family, and they help you throughout the process. You can reach them directly at 401 423 7000. That's 401 423 7000. Or email them at info at mansionsandmanners.com. Now's a perfect time to find your dream home. Mention that you heard them at Discover Your Potential. You are now listening to Discover Your Potential with radio talk show host Dan Gilman, Cindy Gilman's son. So listen, participate, be inspired, know that you can discover your potential. Here is Dan Gilman. Hi, welcome to Discover Your Potential. I'm your host, Dan Gilman, and I'm so excited to be here. And I'm so excited uh, for our amazing guest today. Our guest is Stephen Feinberg. Stephen is a legend of the silver screen. He is an executive director of Rhode Island Film and Television. And he spent the last 22 years in Hollywood, where he worked in every major studio you can think of, developing a Saturn-nominated best science fiction movie, and also returning to the Ocean State in 2004. Stephen has been instrumental in the rise of the Rhode Island film industry, attracting a well over, well over $500 million of movie and television productions, including his own award-winning documentary, Pell. Feinberg is the co-host of the RI Rhode Island PBS weekly series, Double Feature, and a show that explores the art of cinema. Hi, hey. Stephen. How are you? So Thank glad. you for the wonderful introduction. Dan. Uh, I hope it was accurate. <laughs> so. uh, it was very, it was very kind, and I, I want to also um, pay homage to your mom, uh, uh, wonderful you. person, and and uh, I know you're continuing uh, the legacy, and I want to thank you for uh, honoring her and keeping the the show alive and discover your potential alive. Thank you, thank you so much. And I remember when I was a kid, actually. My mother did uh, actually a few shows with you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. There was uh, when she was at HJJ. She uh, did. I think it was at the film festival at one at one point. Yes, yes, yes. And I actually still have the pictures. I should send to you at some point. Oh. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I I know. I remember the pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. It was. It was. It, it's incredible. But I I would love to start out and to kind of harken back to your your own when when you were a child. Uh, what inspired you to go into film? You know, that's a really good question. When I was younger, and I'm talking like seven or eight, um, and I had this conversation with my dad. My dad uh, was a sixth grade teacher. Um, he passed a couple of years ago. But being a sixth grade teacher, he was in tune to what I like, thank, thank God. Um, so he saw I love movies and storytelling, and I was creative. That very much was my dad was also an artist um, as well as a teacher and he was a scientist and my mom was a go-getter so um, and and uh, embraced life uh, and they both gave me confidence to follow my dreams and and if I wanted to do something I just had to follow through and and finish it up if I commit to something I had to do it so um, one hot summer which was you know, in, in Rhode Island, you remember how uh, humid it can be. Um, we we uh, made a movie with my neighborhood friends. It was like, I remember saying to my dad, it's so boring. There's nothing to do. It's hot and boring. And anyway, we got together. I got my friends together. We made a little Charlie Chaplin movie. My dad had a brownie eight millimeter camera and he mm. ran the camera and I told the story and I acted in it. And in the following summer, it was that same feeling, and I said to my dad, Dad, let's make another movie like we did last year. That was fun. And so my father, being that sixth-grade teacher, said, all right, well, this time you just not only come up with a story and get your friends, but this time you you direct it. You do it. You get behind the camera. So we did a little James Bond movie, and that is what started to happen. My dad being a teacher, put more onto my plate because that's what I wanted to do. And um, then I would cut lawns 
uh, to make extra money. And with that money, I would buy film and sometimes I'd buy Super 8 and 8 millimeter cameras. And the nice thing about my folks is uh, if I want to buy a Super 8 millimeter camera, uh, they said, all right, you pay half and we'll pay half. Same thing with the projector. You pay half, we'll pay half. So I had to cut lawns, get enough to half of the money. Then they paid the other half. And I kept upgrading. So first time was silent, uh, a silent use camera that had slow-mo and fade out. And then I got the um, – with sound. And I worked my way up, and then I started experimenting. I did a lot of claymation films. I even did some hand uh, cell animation films, which was laborious. But I, I made like a Pink Panther type of uh, – cartoon that won uh, an award, some kind of New England award that um, happened with some of the filmmakers of Providence. And I saw some college films at that time. And now I'm, I'm probably 12 years old. And that really opened my eyes. I saw, I think, one of the first music videos uh, of the Beatles, A Day in the Life, that a college student had done and oh. using fast, uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, fast-paced uh, cutting. And so... I always wanted to go out to California. I always wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, I always, that was my dream forever and ever. And then one time, uh, I'll cut the story short, but one time we were driving on Route 37, about to hit 95 North to visit my grandmother on a Sunday. And they were talking about the Great Gatsby. My mom had the Sunday paper on her, uh, on her lap as we were driving. My dad was driving. And she talked about filming the Great Gatsby in Newport. And I remember looking out the window as we turned Route 37 on the 95, mm -hmm. and there was a Howard Johnson's around there. And I said, oh, well, maybe one day I'll be in charge of all the movies and uh, shows of Rhode Island. And it was a daydream, but I can tell you where I was, what day it was. It was a Sunday, and it was probably about noon. And um, then here I am in 2004. Uh, the job opens up. Uh, it was fortuitous, and and um, about 250 people applied for the job, and I got it, and and I'm very grateful to have it now. That's wonderful, and I and I, I know for we've got a, a fairly global uh, presence on this show. Uh, for those of the people that are familiar with, really Rhode Island, um, even though you know it's a small state, uh, what what. What do you see the, you know, the, just to, to remind them or tell them the purpose of the Rhode Island film and TV office? Well, the, the part of the, the film and TV office at one point was part of uh, the economic development corporation. Mm -hmm. um, at that time in 2003, the head of the economic development corporation felt it really wasn't doing much. The Rhode Island film and TV office and what he decided to like liquidate it. Um, Randy Rosenbaum, who was the uh, executive director of the Arts Council, mm -hmm. said, no, this is an important office. We need to save this. And legislatively, he brought the Rhode Island Film and Television Office under the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. Um, the mission uh, has always been to attract productions to Rhode Island and showcase our locations to the world. Uh, my addition to that is to do all that mm -hmm. while also cultivating our local talent and educating our local talent um, to provide them with opportunities. And because I, I wanted to help out that young filmmaker like myself and who uh, could stay in Rhode Island and make a living in Rhode Island thrive in Rhode Island um, and not have to go to California or New York because if that person loves Rhode Island and loves their family that they have here, um, I think I tell people this all the time. Nobody loves Rhode Island more than me. You can love Rhode Island as much as me, but not more than me. And I think this is the greatest place on the planet. And I've traveled the world and I just love Rhode Island so much. So uh, if I love it, and there are other people that feel the same way about our ocean state, um, why not be able to do the things that we love, work, play, uh, um, and, and raise a family, and have fun uh, and, and, and here in Rhode Island? So 
What I've been working hard on doing is bringing large productions to Rhode Island, uh, create links between those filmmakers from out of state, like Hollywood, uh, create connections between our local folks, and um, help water the seeds, so to speak, in Rhode Island so that our talented filmmakers and that talented filmmakers, the crew, cast, everybody can can grow and um, blossom. And uh, that is what we're doing while showcasing our talents and our locations across the globe to a diverse uh, group of, of, of people to hopefully have them want to come to Rhode Island uh, for tourism or education or work or play. And, and that's part of what I've been working very hard to do. And I think we've been pretty successful. What, what drove you to come back to Rhode Island and, and, and what, ins and what made you to inspire others to make films in Rhode Island? Well, Dan, when I was living in LA, I always thought that my feet had to be in LA, but my hands would be in Rhode Island. But when I would come home for the holidays, um, I always extended my trip uh, at least a week. And when I would leave, I'd have like this lump in my throat. I loved it here. Um, and I always loved L.A. as well. But then what happened was at one Christmas in 2003, a friend of mine was going through a very painful divorce, and he didn't want to go to Christmas Eve. And I said, I'm going to come back, and we're going to get through this, and you're going to go to Christmas Eve with your family. And while I was here, um, I happened to bump into someone who worked for the Providence uh, uh, mayor's office. Uh, he was dating my, my friend's niece. And I asked her, I said, oh, who's running the Providence Film Commission nowadays? And he said, oh, it doesn't exist anymore. I said, really? I said, that's too bad. I, I would have kicked ass doing that. And because mm -hmm. I love Providence, I always thought it was like a look like a back lot of a movie set, of a, of a movie studio. So, mm -hmm. um, so I got a phone call a few days later asking if I'd come down to meet with um, a couple of folks from Providence Art, Culture, and Tourism, Cliff Wood and Lynn McCormick at the time, to talk about Providence film. And I had probably 30 ideas, but I shared maybe seven with them of what they could do to enhance filmmaking in Rhode Island. And they said to me, you know, this is really weird, but would you be interested in being the head of the Rhode Island film? office and my hair stood up and mm -hmm. i was like what about the guy who's been doing it for 14 years well he retired and they checked on the computer they said yeah it just came up yesterday on the computer there's a two-week window to apply you seem like the right guy to apply um it's the rhode island and and i newport jumped into my head because you couldn't have greater jewels to to oh, sure. showcase than the mansions of newport and all of Rhode Island. So I decided to apply in that two-week window. My former lawyer was the chairman of ABC, as an example, and wrote me a letter of recommendation and Panavision and did a, a friend at Disney. And and I really took it seriously. And I, I said, you know, I'll know in six months if they hire me. I'll know in six months if they get what I need to do to make Rhode Island a, a destination for – being a film-friendly location. And I thought, you know, I could have my feet in Rhode Island and my hands in Hollywood. That's the best. That's me. And fortunately, um, out of the 250 applicants, Randy Rosenbaum selected me. I did not know Randy beforehand. Um, I am grateful to this day that he hired me. Uh, he led me, um, mentored me about uh, – the state government, which I was completely unfamiliar with. But um, I had a dream and I had a game plan. And fortunately, I had someone, uh, the Speaker of the House at that time was uh, William Murphy. And he understood what I wanted to do. Uh, and uh, Joseph Montabano was the uh, uh, Senate president at the time. And he understood what I wanted to do. And uh, Governor Kachiri ended up coming along and we ended up bringing Underdog to Rhode Island and Brotherhood, the television series to Rhode Island. 
Uh, and that started this tax credit program. Uh, and then all of the colleges and universities, after a certain amount of time, years, they began to develop uh, programs. And uh, at all the colleges and universities, now we have kids that are being educated. And, and then the film festival, the Rhode Island International Film Festival, became academy qualifying. So all these things started to we really worked hard together as in the public and private sector to, to form a strong community for filmmakers. Uh, I'd love to talk about what you're working on now. Actually, you're working on quite a bit. And I'd also love to talk about the, the interview that you'll be, uh, that's coming up actually fairly soon. That's going to be published as well. Sure. Um, this has been, you know, quite a challenging year going through with the pandemic and all the last couple of years. Um, but we were able to, in the last year, uh, film uh, The Gilded Age, which is an HBO series, which uh, has been created by Julian Fellows, Lord Julian Fellows of Downton Abbey fame, and, uh, and his producing partner, uh, Gareth Neem. And Gareth's grandfather actually did the, uh, uh, directed The Poseidon Adventure, okay. um, if you remember that movie. So, yeah, so uh, they uh, they uh, work with us. I think it was over 10, 12 years ago that Bob Greenblatt, who I had met when he was the president of Showtime, and we did the Brotherhood series together, he became the um, head of NBC, and he was the one to engage Lord Julian Fellows to do the Gilded Age, an American version. Uh, of Downton Abbey, so to speak. And I remember uh, jumping on a call with Bob immediately when I, when it was announced. And I said, you know, you need to do that in, in Rhode Island, in Newport. We've got the highest concentration of Gilded Age homes in the in the world. And um, he would, kept telling me, Steve, it's premature. He's still got Downton Abbey to do. Um, then there might be a Downton Abbey movie. But I stayed on top of it and worked very closely with um, Trudy Cox and Phil Pelletier over at the uh, Newport Preservation Society. They're the ones that uh, are in charge of the Newport mansions and have preserved them. And um, I remember saying to them, give me everything we have as far as uh, I, I want to know what what costumes we have. Uh, everything that's authentic. I want to know what's in our inventory so I can sell it and make sure that we're at the table. I wanted Rhode Island to be at the table. Well, fortunately, after so many years, um, Bob ended up leaving NBC. The show ended up leaving NBC. Bob ended up resurfacing uh, at HBO, and the show ended up resurfacing at HBO. So it's now an HBO series. We filmed season one. Um, it's been done in New York and in Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's nine episodes. The first uh, episode, I believe, is almost like an hour and a half or two hours. Um, and uh, it's going to be premiering uh, in the winter, this winter, sometime. I'm not sure the exact date. It's moved around a, a couple of times. But there's a high enthusiasm for the show. And, um, and then hopefully we'll be filming season two next year. That's the goal. So... Yeah. Um, that's the Gilded Age. It's something that I think is going to really have an, they, the writing's the highest quality of television writing you'll ever see. The authenticity behind the production is incredible. So you've got uh, all costumes created as authentic as can be uh, mm -hmm. from scratch. Uh, they've used the mansions and it's just A++. Um, and the great cast. So I'm looking forward to Rhode Islanders seeing that. It's going to have a great impact on tourism as well because it's Newport as Newport. Um, and uh, I think there's going to be a lot of love for Rhode Island and the Newport mansions as a result of the show. On top of that, we had Kara Sedgwick do an independent film called Space Oddity that stars her husband, Kevin Bacon. And that was filmed in North Kingston or North Kingstown, I should say, in Wickford. Got a lot of excitement from the from uh, uh, the folks there. They really embraced it, and um, they used 
a lot of local workers and rented locally and uh it's a beautiful film beautiful story um the producer valerie stadler had said that the film is a love story to rhode island i mean a love story to the world and the earth and if you're going to do a love story to the earth what better place than rhode island i thought that was wonderful yeah. um and then as a result of that, and this is just something that is really cool. I don't know if people always realize this, but because we had the motion picture tax incentive, we were able to bring this movie here. As a byproduct of that, um, Kevin Bacon and I were talking, and he had played the Greenwich Odium uh, a couple of years ago with his brother, the Bacon Brothers. That I happen to ask him about uh, if they were playing during the pandemic, and I think he said they played once. Hmm. And we talked about would you be interested in playing again, um, and he said yeah. And so oh, wow. it was arranged quickly that he would be he and his brother would be playing at the Greenwich Odium. Uh, the Greenwich Odium uh, through those cultural grants that we were talking about uh, that Randy Rosenbaum really spearheaded to 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 get those theaters up to ADA um, accessible and help uh, build them and all these other things uh, is now got a maximum, I think of 475 seats and they had just re renovated the balcony at the Odeum. So it was a sold out performance, the Bacon brothers and uh, the show rocked on. And then wow. that has an effect on the restaurants that surround the Odeum whether people are going to buy dinners or have drinks. So the film Space Oddity then had an effect on the Odium, which then had an effect on the community of East Greenwich um, because of uh, putting on a show. And so those are byproducts, indirect um, positive gains by having a film in Rhode Island. So that, that was the other, that was another film we did. Um, uh, Chad Verdi, a local producer who produced The Vault, um, and Tom Danucci of Cranston, Rhode Island, uh, graduate of New England Tech and director, they just finished uh, making a movie called uh, Johnny and Clyde with uh, Megan Fox, uh, that film primarily in Providence. We had another film called Out of the Blue, starring... Uh, uh, award-winning actress um, from *Inglorious Bastards, Diane Kruger, as well as Hank Azaria. Um, and that, uh, that was just recently completed. And everyone knows about this little movie that could, Hocus Pocus 2 from Walt Disney, with the Sanderson sisters coming back, Bette Midler, Kathy Najami, and uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. It's being directed by uh, Ann Fletcher, who we had done a film with before, 27 Dresses. So wow. that's exciting. That's a Walt Disney film uh, hiring a lot of people. There's a lot of enthusiasm. I can tell you folks from around the United States have descended upon Rhode Island to catch a glimpse of the filming. I just saw a video last night of uh, some folks from L.A. that uh, were um, spying around uh, the sets. Uh, there, there's locations in Lincoln and Providence and Newport. Did they already start filming? They started the filming on uh, October 18th, I think oh, was our did. first day. And that was uh, stressful because there was a potential um, strike that was um, – we, we found out at 3 o'clock in the morning, the day of the first day of filming, if there was going to be a strike or not. Thankfully, the strike was avoided by IOTC. It was a, going to be a national strike, but they came to an agreement – with the studios and the um, uh, networks, and so the strike was avoided, thankfully. Um, and then, and then, of course, they're filming outside in uh, Lincoln, and we almost have these hurricane winds and oh, storms. Right. But uh, they were able to, they were able to make uh, make do. Yeah. And um, lastly, I'll just let you know that um, I co-host a show, um, Rhode Island PBS, that you mentioned called Double Feature. And I do that with George Marshall of the Rhode Island International Film Festival and Sean Quirk. And one of my guests uh, this year, it's a three-part um, episode, uh, 20 minutes in length for each 
episode, um, I interview executive uh, producer of The Sopranos, Henry Bronteen, who also directed uh, one of my favorite episodes uh, of The Sopranos, uh, 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 which was, you know, uh, he got nominated for a Director's Guild Award. Um, and uh, so I, I hope folks will turn in uh, to Rhode Island PBS every Thursday night at uh, 8 o'clock, and then it repeats throughout the week um, on Rhode Island PBS, and that's double feature. Do you have any advice for people who aspire a career in TV or film? Yes. Um, I'm Especially, say, specifically in Rhode Island, of course. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is uh, my friend once wrote to Frank Capra, the director of It's a Wonderful Life. And this was, I was at USC film school and he, re, Frank Capra replied, do it. Four letters, D O I T do it. And I never forgot that. And I tell people, no one's going to carry your life ball, like a football. Yeah. Imagine your life is a football. It's in your hands. No one's going to care about that football or your life ball, let's call it, more than you. And I tell people, you know, we could have a meeting and I could give you advice and tell you what to do. And then you're going to leave and I'm going to have another meeting. You're going to leave. It's your life. You've got to carry that ball. Um, and you have to want it. The film and TV industry, there's all different types of jobs. You know, there's... Um, uh, people who are specialists in art, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, painting something that looks like an old distressed building from the 1600s, and they, it's a real art form. Uh, there are other people that get involved in costumes or hair or makeup. Other people that uh, help uh, with greens, you know, like with uh, plants. Other people are, uh, uh, doing um, accounting or secretarial type of work or, you know, it's about making yourself useful um, and depends upon what you want to do. I would say you have to be very proactive. You have to, uh, and again, some of the folks might be uh, drivers or uh, driving the trucks. You know, it's a, it's a whole city of jobs or catering, whatever it might be. There's a lot of opportunities. But you have to really be uh, proactive. You have to make friends and network because friends help out other friends. That's just the nature of things. And, and um, if you have friends that you look out for and friends that are looking out for you, that's going to give uh, increase your opportunities down the road. I always tell people you need to come in with a smile on your face. You need to be a, a great team player. You need to be helpful. You need to be reliable and on time. Uh, if you're supposed to be there at 7.30, be there at 7.15. If you're supposed to leave at 5, leave at 5.30 or 6. You know, yeah. stand out. Um, be happy. Be a team player. Uh, look to help people wherever you can. It's competitive. Uh, it's like, you know, if you ask me, hey, uh, how can you be an NBA basketball player? Well, you know what? There's a lot of folks that have that same talent. Um, but then it's the drive. It's the determination. It's the competitive edge to put in those extra hours and have the talent and raise yourself above the others that are going to make you uh, give you the opportunity to maybe play in the NBA. But then if you're in the NBA, how are you going to be one of the best in the NBA? How are you going to have a long career in the NBA? I remember playing basketball with a guy who was the last person cut from a championship team on the uh, Philadelphia 76ers. The guy was – he had the strongest hands I'd ever seen in a basketball game. I tried to punch the ball out of his hands, and then it hit me. This guy was the last guy cut from a championship team. What? How strong are the hands of the guy who has a reputation in the NBA of having strong hands? Like, how strong are his hands? So yeah. – you know, you really, to, in the film and TV industry, there's different jobs. There's different ways of uh, getting in there. And it's being available, useful, reliable, trustworthy. And uh, so 
There's and starting at the bottom is always a good thing. It's being a production assistant, it's an entry level position. Make friends, get in there. Um, a lot of, you can reach out to my office at Stephen dot feinberg at arts.ri.gov s-t-e-v-e-n dot f-e-i-n-b-e-r-g at arts.ri.gov you can cc my assistant carol c-a-r-o-l dot c-o-n-l-e-y at arts.ri.gov carol dot conley at arts.ri.gov or call 401-222- Three, four, five, six. And say so you want to get on as a production assistant. And if you are good and you're reliable, they will rehire you or they'll look for other, they'll make friends with you and they'll find out what your dreams are. Um, so those are opportunities. If there's a production going on and there's a lot of smaller shows that are welcoming to have new people. Well, Dan, I want to say it's a true pleasure again. I thank you for keeping... Uh, your mom, uh, Cindy's uh, dream alive, uh, discover your potential. The Rhode Island Film and TV office is here to help people make their dreams come true. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, collaborations in the private and public sectors. None of this happens without everyone working together and being Team Rhode Island. And uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. I thank you and, and your audience for listening and and hope that um, we keep crossing paths because it makes the day sunnier. This is Cindy Gilman, and you're listening to Discover Your Potential. So until next time, do something nice for yourself, but do something nice for someone else. In every way, every day, I need less Is the only